and I call the member for Parks. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I rise today to speak about uh, the Appropriation Bill 2017-2018. Uh, uh, I'd like to start off by acknowledging the work uh, that Treasurer Morrison did, and maybe some comments from, uh, from my colleague over the road, uh, the member for Fremantle, when he, uh, I think his closing words were facile, uh, insubstantial, um, uh, focus on money. Uh, that's what budgets are, is the focus on money. And as much as we would like to uh, live in a nirvana uh, where we can do whatever we want uh, in the magic pudding that is the, the budget of the Australian government, unfortunately there are consequences for that. Uh, the politics is the art of the possible. Uh, and uh, you know, over the last couple of days I've had some emails uh, with some criticism on the budget. Uh, in different parts, uh, and, uh, but the budget is not a philosophical uh, sheet of, uh, uh, of wants and uh, needs of, of individual groups. It's, it's a budget for the management of the economy of the entire nation. It's a balance between uh, supporting um, all facets of our population. And so I acknowledge the work that Treasurer Morrison has done on that. Uh, and I might just start uh, on a positive note, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, with the focus on infrastructure for this budget. Infrastructure is, the, uh, is the, the structure, the skeleton of which our economy grows. Uh, the, the announcement of the $8.4 billion on top of the already $900 million that's already been committed to the inland rail is one of probably the, the most exciting budget announcement I've seen in my time, certainly in my uh, nearly 10 years in this place. And uh, I spoke about this in February 2008, at my very first time I spoke in Parliament. I spoke about the need for the Inland Rail. Indeed, during the pre-selection process, one of the reasons I said that I wanted to get off my tractor, leave my previous career in agriculture and go to Canberra was to promote projects that would grow the economy of the area that I represent and the country as a whole. And I spoke about the Inland Rail at that stage and now it's gone from a concept to a reality. Uh, with that reality, uh, actually there, there are some issues and uh, being the member uh, of an electorate that has uh, uh, over 300 kilometres of greenfield site uh, for the Inland Rail, obviously there are some concerns about uh, where that route goes and uh, uh, the disruption to uh, uh, farm activities and, uh, and the amenity of people living in that area. And the, uh, we will work through that with the ARTC. But I will say here today, I am committed to this project. This project uh, is a nation building project in, in, within the same scope of the Snowy Mountain Scheme. Not only connecting the uh, intermodal traffic between Melbourne and Brisbane and taking the pressure off the increasing freight task that now uh, is mainly on the Newell Highway, but the opportunity for the communities in Western New South Wales, Queensland and Victoria to grow on that spine. I've, I've been studying rail for some time. Uh, I've been to Canada and looked at their system and I've seen how uh, the decentralisation of Canada right across the prairies uh, has been driven by rail. And, uh, uh, Already uh, we're starting to see some construction of culverts and bridges ready to uh, take the, uh, the increased uh, axle weights and traffic for the inland rail. Also I was pleased to see uh, in the budget was the confirmation of the promise that was made last year of $25 million for the Integrated Cancer Centre in Dubbo. The, uh, the concept that the people of Western New South Wales can have access to top class cancer facilities, not only for treatment, but for diagnosis. And, um, and the area that that represents, uh, people now are, are dying because of a, a late diagnosis. They're dying because they choose to stay at home in their communities rather than travel to, uh, to Sydney for, or, or Orange for intensive um, chemo or radiation. And so having that service in Dubbo to service the people of the West not only for the, uh, for, for the treatment, but also the early diagnosis with a PET scanner uh, is a great thing. And uh, 
I'm working very closely with the New South Wales government to make sure that that centre uh, is constructed um, as part of the redevelopment stages three and four of the Dubbo Hospital, and uh, hopefully within a 18 months or so we'll see that come to fruition. And we've heard a lot from the uh, members of the opposition about uh, our financial and tax changes in this budget, and we've heard about gifts for millionaires and, uh, and, uh, and 65 billion ripped out of the budget. Um, I have a fundamental different point of view to the members of the Labor Party. I actually believe that the economy of this country, particularly my electorate, Madam Deputy Speaker, is built on the back of small business. People who uh, have the courage uh, to, to step out of their comfort zone, to, to risk what they have uh, and back themselves into starting a business, whether it's someone that uh, finishes their apprenticeship as a, a builder or a plumber or an electrician and, and borrows the money to buy a ute and start their own business and ultimately put on an apprentice of their own and grow those businesses. And so um, we need to back those people. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, if every small business in my electorate, 13,000 of them, put on one more employee, uh, we would have a shortage of, 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 work, of workforce. We would not uh, be able to meet that demand. And so the idea that we can uh, uh, run the country with a government top-heavy approach uh, is false, and we need to back our small business. And already uh, we're starting to see the benefits of the instant asset write-off for equipment under $20,000, yeah, and the, yeah. the, the, the uh, Businesses in my electorate are, are, are doing a roaring trade, are selling chainsaws and quad bikes and computers and toolboxes, trailers, a whole range of, of equipment that businesses can use and write off their tax. But also the, the measures that were in the ag white paper, the accelerated depreciation for grain storage. If you drive around western New South Wales, you'll see magnificent grain storages standing there, uh, built because of the tax incentives. Uh, that enables uh, those farmers to put that in, giving them a greater control of their product uh, and, and also uh, increasing employment in the area uh, as, the, as the construction uh, of these facilities is booming, with, with uh, people selling the uh, silos to electricians, to concreters, to a whole range of other things. The accelerated depreciation for water, where we're seeing uh, massive rollouts of um, uh, water systems across farms where, uh, in the last drought, uh, people were able to manage their pasture more effect effectively because they had a water system that uh, covered the entire property. And, uh, and the same with fencing. Uh, and all, those, all these things require work to put them in. They require small businesses, contractors, suppliers, uh, and all of that is, uh, is feeding through uh, the economies uh, of, of my electorate. There's been a bit of discussion about the funding of schools uh, and, and the massive cuts. And uh, I've had the Teachers Federation uh, run stories in some of my towns um, describing cuts to funding to their schools. And I find it rather puzzling, Madam Deputy Speaker, because I've got a, uh, a list here. Uh, 153 schools in the Parks electorate. I don't think there'd be many electorates would have more than 153 schools. According to the, uh, to the uh, Metropolitan newspapers, I have more Catholic schools than any other electorate in Australia. Uh, and the funding is laid out here, and not one, not one of those 153 schools, not one of those 153 schools has a cut. It actually has an increase. And what the uh, members opposite, and, I, and just for the benefit for the, member, uh, the members opposite, they weren't here at the time. So maybe a short history lesson as to how this uh, uh, this message is coming out. Uh, Prime Minister Gillard, when she was the Education Minister, started the process of, uh, of the needs-based funding, and there's no argument about that. Uh, I have these schools on here. I reckon I've got more disadvantaged communities than any other electorate uh, in Australia. So no argument from me on that. And uh, a funding model uh, threw into the Ford estimates for four years with increases every year. Uh, which, um, which, as in government, we've continued on. The final two years of the, uh, the so-called Gonski proposal was a balloon, an escalation in funding that was not funded 
It's not funny. It's a bit like saying to your kids, OK, uh, this year I'm going to buy you a motorbike. Uh, next year I'm going to buy you a car. Uh, next year I'll buy you a house. And uh, I haven't got the money, but I'm promising you in, uh, uh, in years five and six I'm going to buy you a shopping centre. Uh, don't know where the money's going to come from. Uh, not our worry. Knowing at that stage that more than likely they were not going to be in government, planted a nice little time bomb there. Uh, the member for Sydney was probably already working out her lines three years in advance uh, when that uh, time bomb went into the balloon of the final two years. Irresponsible government for one, raising the expectation uh, of communities that they were going to get something that they never were going to get, and then now uh, uh, scaring communities into the fact that they are getting get a reduction. 153 schools here, and not one of them is going to get a reduction. Private schools, Christian schools, Catholic schools, and government schools. I was at one of those schools the other day. Six students, six students, uh, and uh, in a school with um, smart boards, a uh, couple of support staff, uh, dedicated principal in a very remote part of New South Wales. And the idea that these kids in these schools in the far-flung reaches of our nation are being disadvantaged by this government is false, it's yeah. dishonest, and it quite, uh, quite frankly, um, it's, it's vicious and vindictive. And uh, I will take the, the Labor Party and the Teachers' Federation on, on this issue on every single day. Uh, so, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'll finish up with something that's very, very important in, in my electorate, and that's the NDIS. Uh, the idea uh, that um, in a couple of years' time there'll be an increase in the Medicare levy to fund the NDIS, uh, I, I do believe, I agree with the member for Petrie, it is fair. And if you have a member of your family that's disabled and you live in a city, it's a, it's a, it's a tough draw. Uh, it's, a tough, it's a tough call. But if you have a member of your family, whether it's acquired or, or born uh, uh, with a disability, and you live in a small, remote town, it is an enormous challenge. I deal with families on a regular basis uh, that have to make the gut-wrenching decision to relocate to a larger centre to care uh, for their disabled family member, leave, their, uh, leave the life that they know. Um, the NDIS uh, is, uh, is being rolled out at the moment, and it's, as with any rollout, there's some difficulties. My office is dealing with people who are having uh, challenges with that. And we still have some challenges, Madam Deputy Speaker, in my electorate, because it's one thing to uh, allocate funding to, uh, to, uh, to people. Uh, it's, a, it's another thing to make sure that the services that they require with that funding are available. And uh, my office uh, and, uh, and myself are working through that at the moment. So, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I, I think this uh, is a very fair budget. Uh, I think that Treasurer Morrison has, uh, has indicated a way back, uh, a back to a surplus budget, and I think that's very important. A lot of people in my area understand the need to be financially responsible. And for those um, opposite to uh, have this magic pudding approach, to think that being financially responsible is some sort of uh, uh, choice uh, that we make as a government. It's, it's, it, it's, it's important. Uh, we, we can't expect our grandchildren to be paying uh, for, for the excesses uh, uh, of, our, uh, of our country at the moment. And as uh, we head up to the uh, baby boomers needing peak care, uh, we've got to make sure we leave this country in solid shape. Our grandchildren, uh, when they're the ones in the workforce funding for uh, baby boomers such as myself, uh, in our later years uh, are not only going to be stretched to uh, find the finance, the country, this country is going to be stretched to find the workforce. Uh, and so we have a responsibility to put this budget, put this country uh, in a solid ground so that our children and grandchildren can then build on and enjoy the wonderful lifestyle that uh, the current generation has. Madam Deputy Speaker,